It's not clear exactly what was going through Mr. A's mind when he took all 29 capsules of an experimental antidepressant, other than, of course, the argument with his girlfriend. Mr. A always had trouble making decisions, but tonight he gave in to impulse. Perhaps he thought the pills would course through his bloodstream and turn off one organ system after another until he died. Perhaps he figured that one antidepressant wasn't enough to cure his blues. Maybe a whole bottle might do the trick. Either way, a few hours later, he showed up in the emergency room of a Virginia hospital. He stood at the front desk just long enough to stammer out the words, help me, I took all of my pills, before he collapsed onto the floor. Nurses and attendants rushed to his aid, and their notes from that evening recorded that he was drowsy and lethargic. They found an empty bottle of pills in his pocket, but the sticker didn't reveal any medication that they heard of before. It was just a string of numbers and codes indicating that it had come from a nearby clinical testing facility. All they knew for sure was that Mr. A was in trouble. Sweat beaded on his brow, his heart rate spiked, his blood pressure plummeted to 80 over 40. Nurses threaded a saline solution into his trembling arm as the office staff scrambled to get a hold of whoever ran the clinical trial to figure out what chemicals might be causing the reaction. When they finally made contact with the researchers running the study, the doctors on the other end of the line were puzzled. Yeah, it was true that Mr. A was part of their experiment, but he was part of the control group. The bottle contained 29 sugar capsules placebos. When the staff at the ER told Mr. A that he was taking inert chemicals, his demeanor changed almost immediately. Within 15 minutes, he was fully alert, blood pressure back to normal, and probably slightly embarrassed by the whole affair. Rather than a life-threatening condition brought on by a chemical reaction, Mr. A's story showed up in the Journal of General Hospital Psychiatry as a dramatic instance of the nocebo effect. The nocebo effect is when serious symptoms are caused by belief alone. The effect is the evil twin brother or sister of the placebo effect, or what happens when simply believing a medicine will work and ends up making somebody better. A skeptic might say that Mr. A's blood pressure, heart rate, and fainting were all in his head, but that doesn't explain the very real symptoms that the hospital staff recorded when he entered into the hospital. Our minds don't have direct control over every autonomic process. We just can't think the word, say, adrenaline, and then trigger the hormonal release that we want. But we can occasionally put ourselves in situations that trigger that same predictable hormonal release. When we choose stressors from the outside world, we can choose our biological reactions. It's, it's mind over matter in a weird, you know, sort of roundabout way. And the same goes for the immune system. We can't think it into action, but we can certainly change the environment that the immune system responds and reacts to. And I believe that this explains what happened to Mr. A. And that has implications for the entire medical system. The nocebo and placebo effects are the most mysterious phenomena in medicine. Their very existence calls into question the underlying mechanisms of how the body tackles illness, the function of the immune system, and the power of the mind to control biological processes. Every clinical trial approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has to control for the natural healing power of the placebo effect. And yet, medical research almost never directly studies it. With just a few exceptions, pharmaceutical companies treat the body's inbuilt healing mechanisms as an obstacle to overcome rather than a system to bolster. The remedies of the past half century tend to circumvent the immune system with targeted chemical therapies that attack pathogens or intervene directly in biological processes that have gone wrong. The Western approach has certainly generated a boon in life-saving therapies and radically improved human health and life expectancy. 
That said, when an incurable disease spontaneously goes into remission, most medical practitioners chalk it up to chance. However, it's likely that the healing power of the body isn't just dumb luck, but at least in part a physiological response to the environments that we inhabit, our sensory pathways, and the mindset that we give to the medical treatments. In other words, the placebo effect might actually be what I have called the wedge all along in action. All right, and if you're gonna ask me if a placebo makes you better, it's as valid a medical approach as just taking a drug. After all, the concept of medicine in general doesn't require that you get the medicine in a hospital or from a doctor. Just that the intervention you take alleviates your suffering. Until the invention of antibiotics in 1928, Western medicine couldn't deliver much better results than indigenous medicine anywhere else in the world. In many cases, going to a shaman or a witch doctor offered just about the same likelihood of recovery as seeing a Western doctor. As for hospital stays, the general lack of hygiene often meant that the risk was actually higher. As medical historian David Wooten once wrote, for 2,400 years, patients believed that doctors were doing them good. For 2,300 years, they were wrong. Now, this all changed with antibiotics. They were miracles because they reliably took care of the root cause of infections, the bacterial growth in the body. Later, anesthesia helped our surgical prowess to achieve a similar level of success. Now we are masters at repairing physical injuries. If you break a leg and show up in the emergency room with a gunshot wound, you're pretty likely to survive. And yet, for all those achievements, Western medicine is pretty darn bad at managing chronic illness. The majority of drugs that appear on the market today to manage autoimmune illnesses, psychiatric conditions, hormonal deficiencies, and even cancer, have rather dubious records. Most drugs tested for chronic conditions barely perform two or three percentile points better than the healing power of the mind. While placebo response rates vary drastically, it's common to find drugs where placebos account for between 20 and 85% of the healing power of any given medicine. Now, there are, of course, exceptions here, but this is particularly true for drugs targeting pain, anxiety, depression, coughs, erectile dysfunction, irritable bowel syndrome, Parkinson's, and epilepsy. While that two or three percent is statistically significant across millions and millions of patients, more often than not, when we think a pill is curing our ills, we're actually healing ourselves. This open secret has huge financial implications for the pharmaceutical business. Clinical trials for a successful drug can cost billions of dollars to run, but no patient is going to want to pay for a therapy that their body already provides naturally. And since it's impossible to separate economics from modern medicine, it's also important to note that Western treatments for chronic illness often requires that patients continue to take the expensive medicine their whole lives. In these cases, the disease is much more profitable than the cure. This isn't to say that there's just a big conspiracy against you, but these economics are really, really important to think about. One way to think about the placebo effect is the basic principle of statistics known as regression to the mean, where any sort of complex system will return to its baseline over time. To illustrate this concept, think about the weather in Los Angeles, a city typically bathed in sunshine and pleasant marine breezes. On any given day, you can bet that LA will be pretty nice. Sometimes the heat can spike to insufferable peaks, and at other times it can even rain, but wait a few days and LA will likely regress to the mean and be nice again. Now your body is a little like LA. Illnesses tend to go away over time, whether there's a medical intervention or not. Think back to the last time that you had a cold. Your eyes might have itched, your bones ached, and you might not have been able to stop from sneezing. When you reached for the standard issue cold medicine, the directions on the package probably stated that once you started on the medicine, your condition would go away in a few days. But guess what? It was going to do that anyway. 
Cold medicine will help you feel better in the short term, stopping the mucus, helping you breathe, but even without it, your body should eventually fight off the viral infection and leave you right as rain. Like LA, you'll regress to the mean. In this case, back to being healthy. Now, it's true we feel better when the innate immune system is dormant, but it's important to realize that, quote, feeling sick often isn't the sensation of a pathogen, but the sensation of our body fighting back. All of those cold symptoms are actually evolutionarily inbuilt actions of the innate immune system to help kill cold viruses. Mucous membranes make it hard for viruses to propagate, while fevers raise the body temperature to a degree that makes it harder for them to survive. It's fair to assume that much of what we call the placebo effect is in reality the work of the immune system acting behind the scenes. The body returns to its normal homeostatic state because the immune system rooted out the cause of the illness all on its own. Evolution has gifted humans, and vertebrates in general, two immune systems, the innate immune system and the adaptive one. The innate immune system is the frontline defense and has a standard set of responses. These are like fevers, inflammation, mucus generation, uh, attack cells, pus, that sort of thing. These help attack biological threats, and they're quick and easy to deploy against that threat. The innate immune system is a blunt instrument that has a pretty dramatic effect on how you feel. It alters your internal environment to make it hostile to the invaders. Now, on the other hand, the second immune system, the adaptive immune system, is more selective. This is the special forces rather than the regular army. It identifies the specific threat to the body, learns its weaknesses, then deploys a very targeted response. The adaptive immune system remembers the weakness of what attacked you so that it can deal with the invader more efficiently in the future. In contrast to the innate immune system, you almost never feel the adaptive immune system doing its work. Now, as an aside here, if you want to get an awesome primer on the immune system, you have to check out Philip Detmer's book, Immune. He's the head writer at the YouTube channel Kyrgyzats, and I've never read a simpler description of the insanity of the complex immune system than what he put together. Now, I do disagree with a few of his takeaways at the end of the book, but overall, it's an astounding read. Now, in terms of your cold, the first time you encounter it, your body responds with mucus, fever, achy joints. These are the innate immune response. Meanwhile, your adaptive immune system starts learning the virus's weaknesses and storing that information for later use. The next time you meet that virus, your adaptive immune system responds without you even knowing that there was a threat at all. We like to think that most medicine works like a substitute for that adaptive immune system response. That some scientist in a laboratory discovered the root cause of an illness and then developed a chemical that could eradicate that pathogen with surgical efficiency, a surgical strike. While a few classes of medicine do actually work like that, most of our go-to therapies actually suppress the activities of the innate immune system in order to buy time for the adaptive immune system to learn about the threat, ramp up against the invaders, and neutralize the infection. This was a job it was going to do anyway. Now, our immune system is the best weapon we have to root out the source of most illness. While not perfect, it's been successful enough to allow our species to survive in a world of things that want to kill us. While I would never discount the great achievements that Western medicine has given overall to human health, if we spent half as much money and time trying to invent a better placebo, or maybe more accurately, better ways to train our immune system to protect our bodies, we'd likely discover entirely new ways to treat disease.
Okay, I have a lot to say about the placebo effect. It's pretty much the focus of all of the health books that I've written over the last decade, and it's going to be critical in the new book that I'm writing right now with Craig Weston about how we can rethink our relationship with the medical system and even medicine in general. If you're an American, you know that our system is fatally flawed. It's a weird mix of profit-driven corporations and government subsidies that ends up costing a fortune while simultaneously delivering worse results than the nations in our peer group. However, there are also problems with the way we think about medicine that are more than the way we structure healthcare. Even the way we think about how medicine is supposed to work, like that our bodies are machines in search of a mechanic that can fix any problem by swapping out parts or addressing some underlying problems, this keeps us from having the best possible health outcomes because disease doesn't always work like that. Disease is something more like a Rubik's cube than uh, a string of dominoes. So I think the placebo effect and some of the related mechanisms like the adherence effect, which now that I think of it really needs a video all on its own, they need to be rethought from the ground up. Now I'm gonna do a lot more videos on these big concepts in medicine over the next few months as I dig into this next book that I'm writing. The content of this video is mostly from my previous book, The Wedge, particularly a chapter titled The Placebo Paradox, and I get into a lot more detail about the weirdness of our immune system in it. If you subscribe now, you'll see my thought process as I develop this book while I tackle some really, really big questions in medicine, and I'm hoping that can add up to some interesting thoughts to a robust conversation that's happening not just here on this channel, but also on some of my favorite other channels too. Uh, I really, really suggest you check out Medlife Crisis with Rohan Francis. Uh, his channel is amazing, his videos are just stellar in their depth and his just raw charisma and funniness, but you should also check out the podcast uh, by Adam Rodman called Bedside Rounds. Unlike them, I'm not a doctor, which means that you should probably trust their medical advice just a smidge more than my own, and so I'll include links to their shows down there in the doobly-doo. Uh, but I also have a newsletter that I think that you should sign up for, because as I dig into this, I'm going to send out more notifications of new videos, uh, book recommendations, and other projects that I'm working on that don't really end up or fit directly on this channel. Now, let me know about what you think about the placebo effect down in the comments below. I'm particularly interested in examples of medical literature and case studies that demonstrate how environmental exposure, physical practices, and mental techniques can replace the need for lifelong drug regimens. Lately, I've been also super interested in what happens in hospice care, where terminal patients get better once the medical system determines that they are definitely going to die, but then see their prognosis improve under the palliative care in that location. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, I have a lot more to say. This video in some ways feels just a tiny bit incomplete, uh, and that makes a lot of sense because there is just so much to say on this topic. Tune in next week, and uh, yeah, thanks so much for watching.